today we are going to talk about uh, the R4DS chapter on functions and uh, we'll follow the book quite closely. Uh, we'll talk about uh, advantages of writing a function, uh, when you should write a function, and uh, then move on to talk about uh, uh, different conditions that we can use uh, a little bit on coding styles um, and get into uh, the arguments that uh, we can pass on to the function and, and uh, how to write uh, explicit or how to get like different kinds of returns uh, from a function, uh, namely uh, how to get a explicit return and how to write five of these functions. So we'll follow chapter 19 quite closely uh, in today's talk. And what I've done for us is uh, rather than get into the exercises, I've kind of tried to unpack uh, the different sections uh, a little more. And uh, uh, we can Good morning. Hi, I think uh, Adnab got disconnected, right? Yes, I think uh, there is some uh, problem with Zoom only. Earlier, I was having issue with login. Uh, it was not allowing me to log in to Google. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Probably could be. Hi, uh, did we all get dropped or was I the only one? Uh, no, even I got dropped. Uh, I don't know how. So, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. That is... That is uh, sorry, let me share my screen back up.
can you all see my screen uh yes awesome yeah so uh as we were talking about uh the advantages of writing function uh the first one is that it gives us a uh, we can give functions an evocative name uh so that we can when a big uh chunk of code we can easily recognize what that uh function or that line is doing uh and then uh, a lot of times we use functions at multiple places and uh, suppose one parameter in a model changes uh, we can easily uh, make the change in one place within the function and then all our results can uh, be updated uh, in one go and finally we uh, you know the alternate to using functions is always to uh, copy paste uh, stuff a lot of times and keep changing their parameters and in doing that we can make a lot of uh, errors which are totally avoidable if we use uh, functions so a good uh, uh, thumb rule to uh, the question you know when when we should be uh, thinking of writing a function is that if we have ever copied and pasted a block of code more than twice uh, that's uh, a trigger this should be converted into a function uh, and uh, I really like that uh, cutoff and I keep reminding myself that uh, if I ever have uh, anything that uh, that is copied for more than twice I try to develop a function for that uh, there are three major steps uh, in writing a function uh, the first one is uh, very simple pick a name uh, the second one is to use or uh, list the inputs and arguments that uh, will be used in the function and then uh, write the chunk of code that we want to uh, uh, be computed or, or to be estimated. So this is a very simple example of a very simple function. We have the scale zero one, which is the name that we are giving to the function. And then we call, uh, you know, start writing function by function, uh, uh, first bra brackets or parentheses x, uh, x being the argument uh, that we are and uh, the main part of the meat of the function is essentially uh, within the curly brackets uh, where we are creating a variable called rng which uh, calculates the uh, range uh, of x and then uh, does some computation on that and once we have and this, this is like a, a very simple example of a function that uh, takes a takes a, an input and uh, throws out uh, an output uh, and uh, the immediate next step after writing a function is always to start testing it uh, by providing it different uh, values different parameters so we kind of do that by uh, uh, scaling uh, sort of passing on different inputs to the function that we have just created and then trying to see if uh, it is providing us the right uh, kinds of outputs or not. Uh, the book also talks about a more formal mechanism to test functions, which is uh, called unit testing. Uh, and that has not been covered in this chapter. So I'm uh, very excited to read about uh, how unit testing works. Uh, and it is available in the R packages book. Uh, so if anyone is interested, we can uh, go to that book and uh, read more about how to uh, unit test different parts of uh, a function. Uh, moving on, we have uh, the next section which uh, talks about how to name uh, a new function. And this uh, the section starts off by saying that functions are for, for computers, but it's also for humans. So while R does not care how we name the function, uh, human, humans who read our code, including the future uh, versions of us would care about how we name uh, a function and uh, some of the uh, guidance that this section provides is that uh, a function name should be ideally very short uh, but it also should uh, clearly evoke what the function does so it, it, so it, sh it should be descriptive enough so that it tells us what uh, this function is going to do uh, and then also trying to make it short uh, and given a choice between clear clarity and uh, you know length of the name of the function, I think uh, the book slightly leans towards uh, 
choosing clarity over uh, uh, the length of the function. And the simple logic there is that, you know, as, as long as the function is uh, clearly named, uh, we can al always uh, type a couple of uh, keys in and uh, ours or the fill function would help us with uh, calling the function. So uh, given a choice between uh, shortness and uh, clarity, uh, the, the guidance here is that we should always lean towards uh, clarity. Uh, another rule of thumb that uh, this book uh, kind of provides is uh, that function names should be verbs and arguments uh, should be nouns. So the function should uh, clearly capture what the function is doing and then arguments should have nouns that uh, kind of pass on the names of the data frame or the variables that we are using or, the, or you know, uh, the function that we are, any other uh, argument that we are passing. Uh, a good exception to that is me. Uh, for example, uh, for uh, instance, we could have uh, named mean as compute mean. It would turn that into a into a verb. Uh, but since it's such a ubiquitous uh, operation, we don't really uh, need to uh, give it a verb form. So there are a few ex exceptions when the operation that we are uh, probably going to do is very common it's very very uh, uh, ubiquitous but uh, in general the thumb rule of uh, naming a function as a verb uh, and naming the arguments uh, to be nouns uh, generally hold uh, true and then we can use different types of cases uh, snake case with uh, you know two different verbs uh, being uh, connected with an underscore uh, is recommended uh, as well as a uh, camel case, which is which has you know, the first word uh, in all lower cases and then the first letter of the second word uh, in uppercase uh, is something uh, that is always uh, that that's uh, used quite a, quite a, for quite a few functions. Uh, a few things to avoid, for example, just saying f it's too short. Uh, we can say my awesome function, but this is neither a verb nor is it descriptive. Uh, if we are uh, naming two different functions, I mean, two similar functions, for example, uh, we are calculating uh, column minimum and a row maximum. So they're kind of similar. Uh, we should uh, either do call underscore mins and row underscore max or uh, use a camel case for both the functions, but not, uh, not Try to avoid mixing uh, snake case and camel case for related functions. Uh, this is a good example of impute underscore missing, which is long but it's clear. So as long as uh, we know and we can recall what the uh, function is doing, we can easily recall this function. Uh, and uh, and another uh, important distinction that the book makes is that if we are creating sort of a family of functions. Uh, like uh, the family of functions which we saw in string. Uh, in that case, it's kind of uh, useful to create uh, a function, kind of a function family name. So for example, here we are uh, uh, creating three different functions called input underscore select, input underscore checkbox, input underscore, underscore text. So all these three functions are related and they are uh, dealing with inputs. Uh, so it's uh, useful here to start uh, these three functions uh, with a common family name as against uh, doing the opposite, which is to say select underscore input and checkbox underscore input and text underscore input. This would kind of uh, make it difficult for us to uh, recall the function quickly and uh, yeah, not, not super efficient. So that was... Uh, uh, quite a bit about uh, how to name different functions. Uh, after which the book gets into uh, conditional execution and how we can use uh, if or if else statements within uh, within uh, a function. And uh, it starts off by uh, giving us a very basic structure of an if statement. So if uh, within brackets some condition, and if that condition uh, gets executed and is true, uh, we uh, 
have some uh, codes which which kind of uh, performs computations that we that we want. And if that condition is uh, evaluated to be false, then it's uh, it's a it's a different uh, set of uh, codes that is run. Uh, a simple example of using an if statement within a function uh, is uh, we are creating this function called has underscore name, uh, uh, and we are uh, kind of creating a vector of uh, uh, that called NMS. It kind of captures the names of, let's say, X was a data frame. And then if uh, is null, if this condition is uh, set out to be true, then it evaluates this. Otherwise, it gives us, gives us a different set of outcomes. So it's pretty basic uh, if in statement. Uh, and this is how we can use it within uh, a function. So, so not a lot of things going on there. Uh, however, uh, we do get into uh, different forms of uh, operands. Uh, so uh, a condition must evaluate to either true or false. And uh, if the condition is a vector, then uh, the function will give a uh, uh, a warning message, but if it's uh, NA, it would give an error. So that is something that we should keep in mind. And the book actually has a nice example. Oh, I'm going to show you now in a, in a minute. Uh, and uh, the book also talks about the double OR operator and the double AND operators and distinguishes between these and uh, the single operators. So uh, the main difference is that these double operands are short circuiting, which means that as soon as a function sees a double or sign, uh, as soon as it evaluates a true, it would return a true and not care about the other uh, values. Uh, similarly, if a, a double operand uh, sees a false, as soon as it sees a false, it would return a false. And a good example is uh, here, uh, where we have two different vectors, A and B, uh, with different uh, true and false values. Uh, a double and B uh, would evaluate a false because uh, the first combination that it, it tries uh, is a true and a false and it returns a false. Whereas a, a and a single and B would kind of evaluate all of the elements in the vector one by one and then say, uh, you know, uh, which one of them is a true or a false. Uh, similarly, uh, a uh, double or B, uh, as soon as it sees a true, it would return a true. And uh, uh, whereas uh, a, dub, a single a single or B would kind of return a true and false for each of the uh, combinations of, of the vectors. So yeah, so those uh, are a couple of things that we should keep in mind uh, when we are uh, Creating or using conditions within uh, you know, within a function, or when we are uh, kind of uh, using vectors uh, within within a function and using conditional operation, operations of that. Uh, uh, there's also a small section on multiple conditions, which is uh, I, I've just created a basic structure for us here. So if uh, condition number one uh, do that. Uh, else if that then do something else and then finally uh, if uh, neither of these two statements are uh, true uh, what is the other logical uh, operation that is uh, remaining so it's, a, it's just a simple extension of else uh, if else statement with uh, an else if added uh, between the if and the else so we can uh, and and the use of a multiple uh, uh, conditionality is very similar uh, when we are trying to include it in a function. Uh, after multiple uh, conditions, we talk about code style, and uh, there are three uh, thumb rules uh, for a code style. Uh, so the first rule is that an opening curly brace should never go on its own line and should always be followed by a new line. So uh, an open curly brace. Uh, so we should. So basically, it means that we should not put an enter or or. Uh, sorry. 
yeah so we should never have a uh, curly brace uh, in its as, as or as or on its own uh, in a single line and uh, we can have uh, we should generally have uh, a new line starting after a curly brace uh, the second rule is that a closing curly brace should always go on its own line unless it's followed by else so uh, there are two conditions here one is if a closing curly bracket is not followed by anything else it gets its own line it it kind of uh, stands alone uh, whereas if a closed curly bracket is followed by an else uh, then we don't don't uh, kind of uh, hit a enter uh, between the closed curly brace and the else and finally always indent the code inside curly brace so all the all the codes that we see here either message y is negative or log x or uh, or kind of log x so any code that is between two curly braces should be intended and uh, if not then we can we can choose not to intend uh, so yeah these three uh, uh, some rules really make uh, and help us in creating uh, uh, creating really nice uh, codes and they are like cleaner for us to kind of hit back and uh, whenever we uh, are coming back to this uh, code after a while it, it's easier to understand so i uh, these were certain things that i also found very useful in uh, helping me style my uh, markdown files so with that we move to the next section which is uh, the final uh, segment in this chapter that it talks about uh, function arguments and uh, it starts off by saying that there are multiple uh, there are there are two broad sets of arguments the first one is uh, an argument that or a set of arguments that supply the data and then there are arguments that control the details of computation and generally we should uh, try and uh, supply the data arguments first so uh, whenever we are creating a new function and uh, passing on uh, its arguments, the first uh, arguments should always be the ones that uh, supply the data. And then the remaining uh, arguments could be the ones which uh, are talking about how I mean, the details of the computation. Uh, we can also specify the default value of an argument while uh, developing a function. And as a, again, as a heuristic, uh, the, the default value should always be the most uh, common value of that argument, which makes a total sense as well. For example, uh, if you are creating a function that is calculating a confidence interval, and uh, we generally uh, across all sciences, 95% confidence interval is something which is very common. Uh, so we can use 0.95 as our default value and uh, if someone wants they can also uh, increase that to 0.99 or decrease that to 0 0.90 depending on the need uh, but it we can safely assume that 0.95 is something uh, which would be most commonly used uh, by the function uh, so yeah so this is this is how we pass on a default value while creating the function so here we are creating a function called mean underscore ci and uh, as we see, we our first uh, function is, uh, or our first argument here is x, which is uh, uh, the input of the data input uh, for the function. And we have uh, created another argument called confidence interval or confidence level. And uh, our default value here is 0.95. Uh, so yeah, so some, if someone uh, uses that function and just says mean underscore ci x, uh, by default, the 95% confidence level is used here to calculate the CI. Uh, whereas, uh, if someone had passed on 0.99 uh, as our confidence level, uh, the CI would have been uh, calculated based on that. So that's how we uh, use default values for our arguments. And uh, uh, then uh, I think this is a really important section i found this really useful when i was uh, trying to create a, a package and i kind of identified that when uh, we are packaging different functions uh, it becomes really important that we check for uh, 
values otherwise uh, it gives us weird errors that users might not be able to uh, uh, kind of uh, debug uh, so uh, what we are essentially saying in checking values is that uh, whenever we are trying to uh, uh, pass on that values of arguments to a function, there should be a couple of lines that check for the validity of the inputs. Uh, so for example, we, if we wrote a function that works for positive integers uh, and uh, uh, it does, it would absolutely not work for a negative uh, integer at all. Uh, it would make sense for us to have a couple of lines in our uh, within our function that immediately check uh, uh, whether the input value is a positive integer or not. And if not, then it kind of throws us an error that, hey, uh, this function would only work for positive values, uh, let's say. So uh, this essentially uh, would help uh, users in uh, uh, kind of uh, specifying valid inputs. And it also would save computational uh, uh, effort uh, and uh, because, because the function would uh, not go beyond that point uh, where uh, we asked you to check for the inputs. And a good example for that is to do something like this, where uh, we are creating a, a function to calculate weighted means. And we want to specify or we want to ensure that uh, the values of x and w uh, should be the same. So the value of the uh, the input uh, uh, vector and the value of the weight vector sh should be the same. So we uh, do it right off the bat. We say that, hey, if uh, length of x is not equal to uh, length of y, uh, stop and send me this message. And uh, if it uh, kind of satisfies uh, the condition, then then go ahead and then calculate the sum of the, uh, the weighted uh, average. So this is a really good way which uh, can uh, which can help uh, save a lot of uh, time and energy of someone who is not very used to how the function was uh, made and is not very used to uh, the input parameters that uh, are to be provided here. That was checking values and uh, uh, this is a really important uh, function of any uh, uh, any set of arguments. I'm pretty sure. Uh, we have come across this when we uh, try to call any function and uh, hit a tab to see what all uh, the arguments are. And most of the functions have this as an argument, which uh, essentially means that we are uh, that these three dots can be used to pass arguments from one function to another. Uh, it's especially useful when uh, wrapping functions within other functions. And here uh, we have two really cool examples. Uh, so first we are uh, creating uh, a function and the argument, the only argument that we provide here is dot, dot, dot. And then within that function, we are uh, calling the uh, str underscore c function from the strings r package. Uh, and uh, this dot, dot, dot essentially is passing on the inputs uh, from, uh, our, from the commas function into the string function and then asking it to collapse uh, it with commas. Uh, so that's exactly what it does. It uh, uh, we pass on the first ten letters, uh, and it kind of collapses. Uh, it. And here's another example which uh, kind of takes uh, inputs uh, of any text uh, form and then pads it uh, pads it with dashes. And here again, we uh, kind of provide three dots and keep on passing that dot. Uh, into the next uh, function of phase zero, uh, which kind of then uh, keeps on computing and uh, passes, uh, kind of creates this sort of an output. So yeah, so dot 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 is a pretty uh, useful uh, function, especially comes in handy when we are uh, passing values from one function to another. Uh, and it can save us a lot of uh, time. So, that was dot, dot, dot. Uh, uh, the book also mentioned something called lazy evaluation, uh, which essentially means that arguments in a R function will not be computed until it is needed. Uh, it essentially means that uh, this argument will never uh, be used until, uh, so if they are if they're never uh, used, they will never be called, uh, called uh, which is the way R works. And it 
the book does not get into more detail uh, on lazy valuation or how uh, that we can we can use it or we can uh, kind of uh, uh, make take advantage of it. Uh, but uh, more details on that are available in our uh, the advanced handbook. And finally, we get into return values. Uh, so there are two major considerations of uh, return values. The first one is, do we want our function to return values sooner? Uh, and uh, do we want our function to be pipeable? So by default, uh, the value returned by the function uh, uh, at the end of the, of, of the whole computation uh, uh, or, or the last statement is, is what uh, gets returned if nothing else is specified. So for example, if we don't uh, kind of uh, explicitly call a return function, the last statement, the output of the last statement would also be the value that is returned by our function. Uh, but there could be situations where we want to return a value sooner than the whole uh, computation is actually done. So uh, you know, one reason that it could be uh, useful is to, again, check for values. So here, uh, and the function takes three uh, inputs x, y, and z, and kinds of uh, kind of checks whether uh, either of x and y is equal to zero. If either of them is equal to zero, then we want us want an earlier return because there might be a more complicated code here which depends on x or and y not be uh, uh, equal to zero. So this is a useful example where we do not want the function to be executed. We do not want all of the complex code to be uh, uh, executed if uh, x or y uh, are uh, either of them are zero, so we kind of return a uh, return a value of zero right uh, on top of the function, uh, and uh, yeah, make life simpler, I guess. Uh, yeah, this is also the example where uh, uh, the exactly the one that I was talking about. So, so if there's a whole lot of complex code that is uh, coming up, and we uh, have a certain, uh, you know, criteria uh, that has to be met in terms of the argument, in, in terms of the data that is being uh, provided, uh, we can actually put a, 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 write a simple if function and uh, return something short uh, right up top before getting into the more complex evaluations. Uh, the second reason to use uh, or kind of uh, 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 talk about uh, ex uh, uh, explicitly uh, returned uh, statement is uh, when we want to write pipeable functions. So uh, pipeable functions, I'm pretty sure all of us have come across, uh, which is an integral part of uh, the IDR uh, universe. And uh, uh, this essentially talks about uh, the two types of pipeable functions. So there are there are functions that could be uh, transformational functions or functions that create side effects. So with transformation functions, an object uh, is passed to the function's first argument and a modified object is uh, returned. Uh, and with side effects, the passed on object is not transformed. Uh, instead, the function uh, performs an object like drawing a plot or uh, saving a file. Uh, so yeah, so data operations where uh, we pass on a huge data set and uh, the function kind of uh, does some data reduction or uh, creates some summary is kind of a transformation which where it is transforming the nature of the object which uh, is uh, which was passed into it and uh, what was the output and then we also have uh, side effect functions, which uh, kind of take uh, a value like ggplot. So it takes the data set, but it creates something completely different without uh, necessarily uh, changing the structure of the data. So uh, side effect functions uh, should invisibly return the first argument so that while they are not printed, they can still be used in a pipeline. And this is a good example where we uh, are creating a function called show missings. Uh, it's calculating the total number of missing values in a data frame. And uh, it kind of gives us a output that number of missing values is n. Uh, so when we call missing functions on empty cars, it tells us that, okay, it doesn't have any uh, missing values, 
but when we uh, store uh, uh, the missing the, the show missing uh, uh, function on empty cars into a variable called x and then check the value of x it turns out that it's still a data frame which is really cool so it has it has performed its function and we have made uh, the data frame uh, invisible uh, so it it kind of uh, gives us uh, uh, the required output without actually making any structural change to the data set. So this could be something that uh, we can use and it kind of makes our uh, function to be very pipeable. So we, uh, in this case, we kind of uh, uh, start with empty cars, we uh, do a show missing here. So it tells us that, okay, this, this has no, no missing values and then we mutate and induce a couple of uh, NAs intentionally and then call it again and it uh, kind of uh, shows us that, that there are 18 missing values now. Uh, but the beauty here is that we have called show missing uh, twice uh, and it has performed its operation without actually changing uh, the structure of the data. So this essentially has made uh, show missing as a, as a pipeable function. Uh, and this is something to keep in mind if we want our uh, uh, functions to be pipeable as well, uh, we can, we can uh, do something uh, like this. So that was uh, uh, like two uh, sessions on uh, uh, how and why we, we could uh, want uh, to return our function to return values sooner or, or uh, in, a, in a different uh, structure. And uh, finally, we come to uh, the last section, which is on environment. And here, uh, uh, the book gets into uh, a really cool feature about R, which is that uh, a function like this, uh, which uh, takes a value, takes an input for X and then computes X plus Y. So this is, uh, this function would throw an error uh, in many programming languages because Y uh, is not defined inside the function. But R, uh, according to R, this is valid code because uh, of something called uh, lexical scoping. And uh, it's basically uh, what it does is uh, since y is not defined inside the function, R will look in the environment where the where the function was defined. So something like this, where we uh, where we kind of uh, uh, create a new variable called y, and then call uh, f of ten, uh, it would return hundred and ten because uh, R looked for the value of y in the environment. Uh, which uh, so basically uh, the authors then get into uh, the fact that you know we can actually do a lot of uh, interesting uh, things. So R gives us a lot of freedom uh, to do a very interesting thing. At the same time, this can be you know uh, it can cause a lot of trouble as well if we are not cautious about uh, about uh, how we are using our, using it and how we are kind of uh, uh, allowing R to look uh, for stuff in the environment. So, uh, so that's, I think, uh, the point of this section that it doesn't get into a lot of details on environment, which is probably available in the advanced R book, but it kind of gives us a, a sense of, uh, you know, how we can, uh, how R uh, kind of works uh, in terms of looking for variables in the environment and how we can use, probably use that uh, to our advantage if uh, a situation so arises. And with that, uh, the book, uh, kind of ends and uh, I think it gives us a lot of uh, uh, new information as it as it always does a, a lot of things that we were doing but uh, not uh, had not kind of formally thought about it uh, so yeah so this was it was really interesting to read uh, this chapter and uh, formalize a lot of uh, things that we were doing Any, any questions, comments? Uh, I always thought that dot, dot, dot is for multiple parameters. I never thought that it was to pass the parameter to another function as such. But yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, what do you use as the theme for your markdown HTML the, that you knit? Like the theme is really nice. Oh, uh, the slightly or the HTML? Uh, give, give me a second. 
put that's not our marker oh no that was a slight a slightly presentation so uh, yeah give me a second so if you go to a uh, new file and yeah so so there's an option called presentation here and uh, you yeah. can select yeah you can yes. either select an okay, io slide or yeah so i i like both of these options uh, quite a bit so the difference that i so i i generally prefer slidely because it has this really cool feature of allowing us to uh, scroll down which a lot of yeah exactly do. so for example here i had a lot of code and yeah i could just scroll down and and go to the next line uh which kind of allows us to space our uh, sentences because and with for example with powerpoint we have only that much space right we don't we can't like really scroll up and down uh if if there's a lot of uh, content in a particular slide so yeah this is i can really like this okay yeah thank you Sure. I'm Inakshi. Hey, hi Arnav, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Long time. Sorry, Long I've been. Long time, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Was, are there? Ah, uh, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. I was wondering if. Uh, and uh, there are some uh, best practices that you or aditi or molik you follow for functions that you want to share like among all these like you know in practice what works best for you or what doesn't when you're writing your functions so i have i can go first so i what i have started doing is to uh, so i i follow historically i followed a very bad habit of or very inconsistent habit of Uh, aligning my closing bases, you know, so uh, I at different points of time I followed different guidelines. So sometimes I would uh, indent indent the closing brackets a little bit, and sometimes they would be they would be at different lengths. So so especially happens when we have multiple if else statements, and it kind of uh, keeps on uh, getting indented uh, more to the right. Uh, Yeah, so I think now I'm starting to think of, you know, having no indentation at all for closing braces and always, uh, always have them uh, absolutely left aligned. Uh, I don't know if that if I would stick to that, but this is very new with me. <laughs> yeah, I know. I also yeah. uh, have gone through this, and therefore I have discovered one good thing. See, like yeah. from opening cut. uh closing and then press control shift a that's all it oh, will can, do can it... automatically reformatting oh wow can it can it repeat so select this whole thing yes select all thing oh. and then control shift a oh this is so cool oh wow let me mess this up a little bit uh oh wow this is so nice oh this is yeah very handy does it format other things too would it do in the everything uh, and it uh, in this uh, i mean it is aware of the context also if you do it in r markdown it will behave differently and if it is r file it will have something else oh wow this is fantastic oh yeah oh. This is is this only for like uh, functions or anything anything any oh. r code oh this is so nice yes. Yeah. Thanks so much, Malik. Good for all the codes <laughs> I have now. <laughs> oh wow! This is a this is a new superpower. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. Very nice. Thank you, Malik. Welcome. Does anyone use the function wrapper? Like that automatically wraps your function. No, I have not tried it. No, how okay. does that work? So, um, if you go to, I think code, and there is a like on your R Studio, 
yeah code and you see the extract function yes yeah so if you just type the right hand side of a function uh, and you use this it will automatically create a function so it will like assign so you have to select a code and it will assign the arguments and ask for a name uh, yeah oh so i see okay Oh, uh, that means we should solve it only for one value and then go to code menu extract function. Yeah. So yeah, see what it does like the code that you highlighted. If you so okay, just... let's see. We have this. So I'll do first Control Shift A. <laughs> okay, that. <didn't... laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, extract function. Only for what? R code chunks. Okay. What did? Okay, let me open a script maybe. Okay. Uh... <laughs> oh wow! That that. Yeah. Shall yeah. Yeah. So this most of the times it gets gets things oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. It ah. So, so okay. yes, you'll have to inspect it a little bit. So, but sometimes if you have multiple arguments, it just picks everything and uh, uh, does it. So I find that useful. Yeah. From it's actually time. very useful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing. This is sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. It has been so great as usual. <laughs>